It is a monster hurricane, Sandy, now heading up to the eastern seaboard. It's sad because these people have been through it so many times already. The rain's coming down hard. Wind gusts up to 60 miles an hour. God damn, what well, I'd be digging. Two deadly shootings in Me, he's just, he's pure evil. It's terrible. I did an awful, awful lot that was wrong. A lot of very innocent people got hurt. I'm gonna go over. Temperature near zero. If the good Lord's willing and the great don't rise. It is a monster hurricane, Sandy, now heading up to the eastern seaboard on a collision course with two other weather systems. Throughout the next hour, we will take you live to the northeast where people boarded up windows and filled sandbags in preparation for this superstorm. And of course, we have crews live along our coast to look at the impact of Sandy on North Carolina. I am literally in the thick of it. This is the sea foam. This is an indication of how far the waves are coming up today, much farther than they had yesterday. We're not even at high tide yet. So conditions out here on the beach worsening, not necessarily the wind. The wind is not as intense as it was yesterday, but the rain has picked up. The waves are more ferocious and stronger and rougher than they were yesterday coming up higher. Highway 12, a, a major issue because of the waves that are coming over and the sand that's being pushed on the road. We've been dealing with the rain all day, very dreary, and when it's pelting at you from winds 30 to 50 miles an hour, it is downright miserable. Now here's the latest from Deer County Emergency Management officials. Road closures throughout the region because of ocean overwash. Highway 12 on Hatteras Island at Oregon Inlet closed because of sand and water covering it. Some areas on Hatteras Island experiencing flooding already. And we've seen some flooding here on the northern part of the Outer Banks. This nonstop rain and wind just making life miserable. And quite honestly, you cannot stop the ocean. The chilly salt water blanketed any pavement in Kitty Hawk, turning buildings into mini islands, flooding out an RV park with water nearly waist high. Went outside and seen the water running right down the road and it started coming in fast. This looks much rougher than what we saw yesterday morning. Uh, tell us what you're dealing with out there, Bruce, and how it's it's changed in the last hour or so. Yeah, I mean, even the last half, the last half hour. I mean, the conditions have really gotten worse in just the last half hour, hour or so. The winds picking up, the rain still coming down, and the waves coming up farther than they have since we've been here. Don't forget, about 8, 815 is high tide. So for the next two hours or so, things could get really worse. And to find out what this really means, we're now jo being joined live by the Dare County Manager, Bobby Outen. And, and, and Bobby, thank you, first of all, for being here with us this morning in these conditions. Um, but first question, Highway 12, down south of Oregon Inlet. What is the very latest there? We know it's been impassable. Uh, where, where do we stand? It it's, remains impassable. It will remain impassable throughout this event. Here in North Carolina, a major story today came from a big ship and a stunning rescue caught on videotape. The HMS Bounty, a very popular ship, is lost. 14 crew members saved. We'll take you live to the Coast Guard station where the survivors were taken. And Governor Purdue summed up the state's experience with Sandy with one sentence. But in my mind, North Carolina on the coast has dodged a really strong bullet. And for that, we should all be eternally grateful. And the mountains are another story. The governor has issued a state of emergency declaration for another 24 counties in the west where flurries are already flying as Sandy wraps back around. We will take you live to the October snowfall event in just a few minutes. It's part of our team coverage over the next 90 minutes. We have live reports from the North Carolina coast, Delaware and lower Manhattan as Sandy arrives. We have that breaking news now. We just learned the Coast Guard found one of the two missing crew members after their ship sank off our coast today. They were on the HMS Bounty. At 4.30 this morning, the captain ordered everyone to abandon ship. The Coast Guard rescued 14 people. Now that makes it 15 people. The crew was on the move, hoping to avoid the hurricane when it started taking on water. WRL's Amanda Lamb spoke with the Coast Guard members involved in the rescue. Amanda? 
Deborah, they have been looking for those two missing crew members all day long. And about five minutes ago, we learned that 42-year-old Claudine Christian of Oklahoma had been found alone in the water, unresponsive, and was taken to Albemarle Hospital. Now, as you said, this all started early this morning when they got there. There were 14 people in lifeboats. The ship was underwater except for the mass that was sticking out, an eerie sight, the crew members said. And the other person who is still missing is the longtime captain of this ship, 63-year-old Robin Walbridge. Like something out of the movie, The Perfect Storm, when the Coast Guard crew arrived at the life rafts carrying survivors from the HMS Bounty, the conditions looked insurmountable. Did you look down this morning and go, oh boy. It's going to be a tough one. About a dozen times. 30 foot swells and 50 mile an hour winds made for a dangerous mission. The rafts turned over in the violent surf multiple times. It was co pilot Lieutenant Jenny Fields' first rescue operation. All those things they tell you about in stories and things you to watch for in school, but to actually go out there and see them for the first time and be able to put, you know, the book to action was was pretty, pretty amazing. It's like something out of a movie. Oh, absolutely. This is one of the cold water suits the survivors were wearing today. It kept them warm, it kept them floating, and it also allows rescuers to see them. We talked to members of the Red Cross today here in Elizabeth City, and they say those survivors are devastated by the loss of that crew member yesterday, and they're still holding out hope that their captain will be found alive. Helicopters searching for the captain of the HMS Bounty were back in the air Tuesday. Coast Guard officials believe the captain, 63-year-old Robin Walbridge, and 42-year-old Claudine Christian, who died Monday, may have fallen directly into the water as the ship rolled over. Hollywood makes everything big. Walbridge spoke to WRAL in 2005 about his pride in the bounty. They did everything. They discovered the new world with ships like this. This is just such an important part of our life. The majestic ship was on its way from Connecticut to Florida, trying to get away from the storm. A Facebook post Saturday says their decision was, quote, calculated and that they would be safer at sea than in port. Hurricane Sandy is doing something we have not seen in a very long time. One storm impacting both ends of the state. And we have just the crew to prove it. By this time yesterday, Brian Mims and Richard Atkins were showing us these conditions in Riceville Beach as Sandy headed north today. They traded rain for snow, drove to Boone to bring us the conditions there. Okay, Brian, I see you traded your rain gear for a hat as well. What we're seeing now is just something beautiful, David. This is what I love about Western North Carolina. We're not seeing any big puffy flakes just yet, just some good flurries here on King Street in downtown Boone. I've even heard word of whiteout conditions. This is a monster storm in size right now and will become a monster storm in terms of intensity as we head toward tomorrow and tomorrow night. At first glance, it looks like a bomb was dropped on Breezy Point, New York. I mean, just looking out at this, it's just it's crazy. Yeah, the destruction is terrible. You know, honestly, my thoughts and prayers are with everyone here. Marines from Camp Lejeune in Jacksonville, North Carolina, have put those thoughts and prayers into action, helping homeowners get rid of water and debris left behind by Hurricane Sandy. In addition to the hurricane damage, people here in Breezy Point lost more than 100 homes due to a fire that started during the storm. People here say it will take years to rebuild. Introducing another weather innovation from WRAL, the new WRAL Hurricane Center. Interactive maps at our fingertips. Tracking precise details of tropical systems. Our exclusive FutureCast predicts where the strongest winds will be. We will pinpoint the highest wave, storm surge, and rainfall. Track the tropics with Greg Fischel and the most experienced team of meteorologists in North Carolina. The WRAL Hurricane Center. Innovative coverage you can count on. Justice today for members of Kathy Taft's family. Jason Keith Williford sentenced to a term of life imprisonment without parole. Jason Williford learns his punishment more than two years after Taft's senseless death. And he was the last person that, that saw my mother essentially alive. To me, he's just, he's pure evil. With a conviction and now the sentence handed down, those who knew Kathy Taft can remember her, not as a victim, but as the mother, friend, and champion for children. 
can't detach from such an exceptional woman. We were not ready. We were not finished loving her. After weeks of testimony that ranged from details of the investigation to the mental health of Jason Williford, the jury made up of six women and six men sentenced him to life in prison. Thank you for joining us. I'm Jackie Hyland. And I'm David Crabtree. Today's sentence comes just days after the jury found the 32-year-old guilty of first-degree murder and the death of Kathy Taft. It took the jury just five and a half hours to reach the unanimous decision on the conviction. Kathy Taft's children were understandably emotional as they took the stand following today's sentencing. Jason, I don't know why you can't look up here, but you took away my mom, my dearest friend, my mentor, my children's khaki, and my husband's Kathy Taft. When you murdered and raped her, you killed something within me, and I will never be the same. We didn't just lose that beautiful smile of hers. We lost a piece of ourselves. We still need her in our lives. We were not ready. We were not finished loving her. Kathy Taft's children joins us now, and I want to thank each of you for coming in to talk with us. This has just had to have been a hellish experience for the past two plus years. Now you've been in this trial for several weeks, drained, and we thank you for being here. When you heard the sentence today, was it just Yes. Do you agree with it? Absolutely. Breaking news from WRAL. Good afternoon. I'm David Crabtree. The jury in the John Edwards trial has reached a verdict on one of six counts. The jury came back, you know, they went back in about 3.20 or so this afternoon. The judge encouraged them to try to reach a verdict on all these counts. They, they knocked at about 4 o'clock with another note, and this note read that they felt that they had exhausted every aspect. Those were their words, exhausted every aspect. And we don't know what that verdict is. The judge right now has given an opportunity to the lawyers to argue what should be done in this case. And it looks like there's some movement coming out of the courtroom right now. So I'm going to going to go find out what that is. Actually, I'm hearing reporters scream not guilty right now. So apparently count three was not guilty. Is that correct? Okay. I just heard from CBS News, our partners, of course, that count three is not guilty. Of course, we have now learned since I last spoke to you that the judge has declared a mistrial on the five counts that the jury has not agreed on. The jury found John Edwards not guilty on count three, which was a count of accepting illegal campaign contributions from heiress Bunny Mellon into 2008. I was actually handed the actual copy of the verdict sheet. It has been filed May 31st. This is Edwards get out of jail free card. No unanimous decision written by each of the five counts and then the not guilty X by count three. There is John Edwards followed by his dad mm -hmm. There's and Wallace his mom and, Bobby. and uh, Kate. While I do not believe I did anything illegal or ever thought I was doing anything illegal, I did an awful, awful lot that was wrong. Well, just imagine seeing your name scroll across the TV screen saying that authorities are looking for you and that you abducted your son. Well, that's what happened to this mom in Rayford last night. But the twist came when WREL knocked on the family's door. The mother, Karen Joyce, said she had no idea about the Amber Alert and that deputies never went to her home. Well, I was watching TV and my son just freaked out because of the fact that we were on the name was going across the bottom of it. She was in shock, she was confused, and no one's called you or contacted no, you? No, the phone hasn't rang. And you've been here since 5.30? Mm-hmm. Mildwarf says it's the most bizarre news story he has ever been a part of. I was confused as to why there was an Amber Alert when the person they're looking for was home the whole time. So he called the sheriff's office. And I said, I've spoken to the mother. She said, you spoke to the mother? I said, yeah, I spoke to the mother. Where is she? Well, she's at the house. So she, and then the detective says, so she's telling you she's at the house. I said, she didn't need to tell me. I'm at the house. This is where I spoke to her. Less than 20 minutes later, deputies arrived to the house along with Child Protective Services. Child Protective Service comes take my child. Joyce was distraught as she showed WREL papers that told her she had to undergo a mental evaluation and that they were taking her son. I can't abduct my own child. Two deadly shootings in Raleigh less than a half mile apart 
It's a search for answers right now after a woman is shot and killed at a popular shopping center. Then the suspect took off. Late this afternoon, a second shooting nearby, a suicide. Police are not commenting, but all indications point to a connection. This is not the scene you would expect to see at Cameron Village on a bright, cheery morning. Suddenly, you know, I heard like, I think six or seven, what I thought, shots, and then I thought, oh, it must be like construction. But the sound was shots being fired in the parking lot. A woman arriving at work at Pier 1 was shot to death in front of the store. So you were one of the first reporters on the scene this morning, and I know that that's a popular area, especially for people to go to lunch. Did people hear about this and just not venture to Cameron Village today? And there was a guy, he was half running, half walking down Daniel Street, and I thought it was weird. Hours later, another deadly shooting in the 1000 block of Wade, an area surrounded by businesses, a shopping plaza and apartments. It's believed the man shot and killed himself. Right now on WRAL, family and friends say goodbye to a UNC student who became the victim of murder. A funeral service for Faith Hedgepeth was held today as police continue the search for her killer. The 19-year-old junior at UNC was loved by many. Gerald, there wasn't an empty chair in the church, and some would say there weren't any dry eyes either. More than 2,400 people showed up to last night's wake. Similar numbers today at the funeral. Services just ended a short while ago. All here to comfort friends and family members. Joining me right now, Roland Hedgepeth, Faith's father. We all wonder why. We all wonder why. That's the biggest question. And, um, of course, Knowing why I won't bring faith back, but at least it, uh, if the person is caught and justice is brought to bear. You're about to witness shocking video of a traffic stop that turned into a near fatal shooting. <gasps> Two year old Jacob Taylor points to the plethora of police cars in his playroom. He's old enough to know daddy rides around in one, but not old enough to understand how close dad came to dying when he pulled this car over on I-95 for following too close. And the license please. Can you roll the window down? No, I was. I, 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 no. Five shots after just four seconds at the window, and only one of those five bullets missed. I've been shot! I've been shot! I've been shot! Shot down! Give me an ambulance, please! Great car! Going towards the room! We thought I've been shot in the neck! Michael Edgerton and his fiance Renee Phillips would leave Taylor for dead. They were wanted criminals on the run from Pennsylvania authorities in a stolen car. The driver actually had his hand um, with the gun already in it um, between the seats as I made my approach. Taylor's vest blocked one bullet, but the others ripped through his hand, his stomach, his neck. He thought this was it. I was literally choking on blood and um, you think of an injury like that, you think it's going to be fatal. Um, and absolutely, there on the side of the road, I thought I was going to die. He thought of his wife and little boy. I was mad at myself because I felt like I was going to let them down if I was going to die. As for Taylor, amazingly, the incident was just a bump in the road. He's been back on the job a year, promoted to detective. That bullet to his gut? It's still between my heart and my spine. Yes, a bullet is still in him. And this in the palm of my hand? I cut myself on all time shaving and. <laughs> that's shrapnel that's still coming out of his neck. It's like um, probably the worst splinter you've ever had. <laughs> and that gun hand? The bullet went in here and it shattered literally both bones. It actually fires better now than before he was hurt. I, 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 no! Watching the video over and over, Taylor and his chief agree. He followed procedure. Sometimes you can do everything absolutely perfectly right, and everything is going to go absolutely horribly wrong. A lot of very innocent people got hurt in this situation. Where did things academically get out of whack? How could a head coach not know what was going on? It's not going to be the end of my career. Now, the mood on campus today has been vacillating between shock and surprise. Some people said they thought they saw this coming, but there's also been a lot of tears on campus today from faculty members, even from some of the students. WREL's Sloan Heffernan with many uh, from both groups today. She joins us now from the Old Well. Sloan? Like you said, David, Holden 
Thorpe's announcement literally brought some faculty members to tears. Students were also upset, but some say a change in leadership may be needed now more than ever. News spreads fast on a college campus. It's definitely come as a shock to me and I think to many other students. The news that UNC Chancellor Holden Thorpe would be stepping down at the end of the school year hit Carolina students and faculty hard. The academic fraud among athletes to Carolina had nothing to do with the athletics department. That's the word from an independent report released this morning. A panel led by former Governor Jim Martin looked back over 18 academic years interviewed 84 people before reaching their conclusion. Cullen Browder is here now with the bottom line of this extensive report. Cullen? Well, David, former Governor Martin called this academic misconduct a mess that has absolutely embarrassed UNC Chapel Hill. But at the same time, he said that he found that it was actually confined only to here, the African and Afro-American Studies Department here in UNC, and more specifically, the former chairman, Julius Nagaro, and an administrator, Debbie Crowder. This was not an athletic scandal. This was not an athletic scandal. It was an academic scandal, which is worse. Bill Friday was the essence of excellence and integrity in the state of North Carolina. He was a relentless fighter for trying to help those who were less fortunate. Never stop learning, never stop learning, keep going, keep going. That's the person that's going to get ahead. I've been at this business for 32 years. This is the first time I've struggled with finding the right words to adequately describe what a major impact one person has had on so many people in this state. It's just remarkable. There really is a Carolina blue heaven. We know that Bill Friday is up there right now, smiling down on us. That familiar tune, America's right, Sheriff, right, as he patrolled the living rooms of our childhoods. Now that famous whistle has been silenced. Tonight, we remember the life of Andy Griffith. Thank you for joining us. I'm Deborah Morgan. And I'm David Crabtree. If you're from North Carolina, chances are you have watched a lot of episodes of The Andy Griffith Show. In fact, Sheriff Taylor and Opie sort of seem like second family. And that family is feeling a big loss tonight. Andy Griffith died this morning at his home in North Carolina along the Outer Banks. I know how it is to be with, and I know how it is to be without. We have to find places to park because this is my home right now. I know how it is to be with, and I know how it is to be without. For Lee Venable and her husband John, this is a time without. Evicted from the Raleigh apartment when they couldn't make rent, the Venables started living in their Mercury Mountaineer SUV. This is day nine. This is my home right now, and uh, there's nowhere, there's nowhere for us to be. Despite their circumstances, the Venables agreed to let us ride along with them and see their struggles firsthand. We have been looking for work. We can find it's work. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. I was thinking it's a beautiful day. I was thinking everything's okay. Cause I know. I know. He watches. He watches. Over me. Over me. Over me. How can you sing a song like that when you're having to live in your car? That, that, that song. He over me. That song is how I make it. Instead of coming here to find a new home, these animals come here to die. This shelter puts down almost every single animal. 99% of dogs and 100% of cats. Yes, every single cat. WRAL investigates. Thursday, we found inspection after inspection failed. Heartbreaking conditions. So when I tell you you have the highest kill rate in the state, what's your reaction? 166 hours of work in one day. That's impossible, but that's what state records show if you look at the Medicaid billing tied to a licensed therapist in Wake County. We're with WREL TV. I'd like to talk to you about your, uh, your Medicaid billing. Can you talk to us? According to the state records, you billed $1.8 million last year. That averages uh, more than 60 hours a day. How is that possible? 
Tonight, WREL investigates high-paying, temporary state jobs that were not advertised. It seems like a, a classic case of uh, nepotism. I didn't have oversight over anyone. Um, I knew, of course, my son, but other than everybody else, I had no idea. How several members of the state disaster reserve team got jobs based on who they knew instead of what they knew. On Carter Avenue in Durham, there is a sense that tension is brewing. Five different schools have bus stops near this intersection between 6.30 and 8.30 a.m. Before the last few buses pick up, people start stirring at this house. It's a place where 10 registered sex offenders are living, along with other former convicts. 10 sex offenders. Seven of them have records for crimes against children. We counted 12 children at those bus stops. Some waited with parents, others were all alone. This is the press briefing room at the White House. This is the place where network reporters get to ask their questions. Today, I get the unique opportunity of going one-on-one -on -one with President Obama. And the Secretary of Defense have come up with a smart plan. Take a look at this over my shoulder. First, a firestorm of social media criticism. Today, enormous crowds of support. We're looking at people who made it to go out of their way to Chick-fil-A's all across the triangle today, from the triangle and down to Fayetteville. Now, the president of the fast food chain triggered a lot of controversy for his comments against same-sex marriage. And today, thousands packed into Chick-fil-A locations across the country to show their support. Brian Mims joins us live from Fayetteville with both sides of what has become an intense debate. Brian. David, this is the Chick-fil-A on Skybo Road. Would you just get a load of that line of people and the line of cars at the drive through circles the building and it stretches all along the edge of the Lowe's parking lot here. It is a spectacle. This is not a pilgrimage exactly, but a proclamation. On November 6th, your votes will decide who will lead North Carolina as the next governor. Tonight, North Carolina Wesleyan College and the Rocky Mount Area Chamber of Commerce welcome Democrat Walter Dalton and Republican Pat McCrory. Over the next hour, you'll get to know both candidates and hear where they stand on the issues important to you and our state. So we welcome all of you and we thank you for joining us. This live debate is being televised all across North Carolina. So for those of you from Murphy to Manio, we appreciate you being with us tonight. We think and we are confident it's going to be a night of information for those of you who either have already voted or plan to vote on November 6th. Before we get started, let's meet the nominees because as I said, one of them will be our next governor. In North Carolina, we still build and grow stuff. We're evolving, but stay true to our roots. To get unique perspective on this election, you have to listen. WRAL's Five Town Tour down Main Street, North Carolina. Tomorrow on WRAL News. Now tonight at 11, Jackie and Bruce will answer the question, where's the Tea Party? Look for their stories every day of the convention, including live reaction to Mitt Romney's acceptance speech on Thursday night. You can watch all of the speeches live every night We'll stream them in the live section of WRAL.com and air them on WRAL2. That is over the air on 5.2 or Time Warner Cable, digital channel 106. The delegates have finally arrived, and for the first time this week, you can really feel the energy here at the Forum. North Carolina's delegation started leaving their hotel in St. Petersburg around noon today. And among the initial crowd, three people from our state who addressed the convention within the past 90 minutes or so. Right now on WREL, the Democratic National Convention underway. It kicked off just about an hour ago as the party gears up for a week full of events. Thank you for joining us. I'm Deborah Morgan. And I'm Gerald Owens. Delegates are filling the Time Warner Cable Arena in Charlotte. The governor had a very busy day today. She started about 8 o'clock on WRAL's early morning news and a live report there. Went on there to become a cheerleader for the delegation. On election night, count on the power of WRAL. Live from our new election headquarters. Get the fastest results on three channels. Complete national and local coverage starts on WRAL. Unique local analysis on WRAL 2. WRAL is live with the winners and losers on Fox 50 at 10 and WRAL at 11. On TV, on WRAL.com, on WRAL Mobile. On election night, count 
on WREL News. We are back in the WREL election headquarters where more results are coming in. Thanks for being with us. I'm David Crabtree. I'm Deborah Morgan. Interesting to see how North Carolina is playing nationally. We expect him to take the stage at some point tonight. We don't know exactly when that will be. Brian Mims live in Boston. Brian, great job. We'll be back with you later. Right now, let's go to Ken Smith in the windy city of Chicago. Ken? On election night. From the WREL election headquarters. WREL News delivered the fastest results. It's an interactive way to really show the results come in. Just received Wake County numbers. Comprehensive coverage on three channels. We have six crews live with the candidates tonight. Your personalized election experience on multiple platforms. First time in 20 years. North Carolina is going to have a Republican governor. A lot of changes in North Carolina politics. WRAL News. Coverage you can count on. which means it's your last chance to get that delicious fried fair food for another year. Oh. <laughs> oh. You are musical. <laughs> well, all okay, right. all right, Just all right, okay, I'm going to try it. All right. <laughs> hey! <laughs> she tried. Hey, that's... Uh, Bill says one more time. <laughs> I think Brian is eight years old. What do you think? <laughs> While you're out at the fair today, stop by the WREO booth and say hi. Amy Wilmoth, Brian Schrader, Nate Johnson, Mike Mays, Jackie Heinlein will all be out there throughout the day today. We may be having a mild winter here. In other parts of the U.S., winter's fury is raging. Chief Meteorologist Greg Fischel traveled hundreds of miles to Mount Washington, New Hampshire. It's an area covered in thick snow and ice. David is with Greg now in the HD Weather Center to talk about this incredible experience. Yeah, you know, you got snow and ice, but you add hurricane force winds to this, and it's a recipe for some of the worst weather in the world. We're on the summit of Mount Washington, 6,288 feet above sea level, home of the world's worst weather. Looks like something out of a horror movie. We're on the top of Mount Washington, New Hampshire. Temperature near zero. Winds sustained at 70, gusting to 90. This is unbelievable. I've been in prison now close to 17 years. Our life goes on. This whole thing was rotten from the beginning. No weapon, no witnesses. That's when the nightmare really began. I absolutely did not kill Jaquetta Thomas. If I was convinced in my mind that I'd kept an innocent person in jail for 17 years, it would tear me up. And I can tell you, I hadn't lost a minute's sleep over this. Time changes everything. a serious concern from here in the triangle and all across the country an eye-opening number of drivers report the same issue they're simply driving along they hear a loud scary boom the next thing they know their sunroof is gone the fresh air light open feel for many car buyers sunroofs are a must-have but plenty of owners are finding the must-haves might bust Big time. And all of a sudden, it was like, a, I heard it like a gunshot, and it was so loud. The bang was the sunroof on Nikki Wheeler's brand new Kia Optima. It exploded as she drove down busy US-1. You still haven't tackled your taxes. Five on Your Side is here to help. Monica LaLiberty is in Studio 8 tonight where you can get tax help for free. Monica. Oh my gosh, you know, these folks, they love tax time, obviously. This is what they do, but most of us, and I'm included in that group, we dread it. The paperwork, the numbers, I cannot stand it. But that is why we have folks here to help you through it. We've invited tax professionals. They are taking your phone calls, answering your tax questions. They are all volunteering their time. The first battle of the blues of the season ends with a bang. 
Duke and Carolina, two top 10 teams in arguably the most heated rivalry in all of sports. This game goes down to the final buzzer. You just watched it, an instant classic, and just exactly what this Duke Carolina rivalry is all about. Let's go, Duke. He's so excited he can't answer the Let's question. Go, that was exciting. Oh my gosh. I knew they was going to pull it off. Don't you know that Shashevskyville erupted when Austin Rivers hit that three point shot at the buzzer? It was an incredible ending, and there they are, everybody gathering on the Duke campus. For 32 years. It's that time. Friday night. Great night for football. Let's go. The most games. That's it. The best plays. The hardest hits. Get ready. Ready for a show, baby. Let's go. Football Friday with Tom Suter starts now. I do like that, Tom this demonstration marks WRAL as the first commercial TV station in the country to bring you this cutting edge technology. In the not so distant future, the mobile emergency alert system is how WRAL can use its broadcast signal to get you life saving information in times of crisis. Okay, I'm not looking down. Elizabeth, I know you're nervous, but don't forget to take in the sights and look around and see this pretty city from a whole different angle. Ooh, yeah, that's kind of scary. <laughs> I hear people down below though. We are getting closer. I was hoping to like to be really cool and do some bouncing off the uh, windows, but I've been way too scared for that. There's my little boy. Hey, Max. <laughs> I'm really happy to have been able to do something to um, bring attention to Special Olympics. Let's go back to Ken Smith and Cheryl Underwood from The Talk on CBS. And Cheryl, have you heard any good resolutions down there tonight? Yes, I've heard some do. Hey, this is Cheryl Underwood, WRAL's Acorn Correspondent. What is your New Year's resolution? Uh, to eat healthier, I think. <laughs> These are all people that love the Acorn yeah. crop, but we need your possum crop, too. <laughs> Brasstown is a teeny tiny community tucked in the corner of Clay County. But Brasstown is not about to roll over and play dead. I was thinking about the love of Sheridan driving kind of slow. I saw a half a dozen possums in the middle of the road. There's a possum to the left and a possum to the right and a possum hanging from the roof by the Brasstown traffic light. The beam of light hit two red eyes and a long and pointy nose. There's a big old mama possum in the middle of the road. It's just another day at Clay's Corner, home of the possum drop. So this must be the place. Happy New Year! New Year's Eve, a live possum in a plexiglass box. It's a party in the possum capital of the world. And at midnight, down comes the critter, the crowd gives a shout, and the pointy-nosed possum is politely let out. Just be an old mama possum in the middle of the road. Well, this store here to me is just like a part of our mountain culture. A store where folks gather around for supper. We got beans and taters and cornbread too, and possum on the pot and a little bit of stew. Pass the possum water, please. There's serious stuff takes place here. We've never had a murder solved here in Bracetown. Murder? Never. You know why? All the DNA's the same. <laughs> All this possum paraphernalia started with the store owner, who started selling possum. Then possum light possum. Well, the way you get a diet light possum is you run over it and over it and over it and get all the cholesterol, everything run out of it, you know. Then came sun-dried possum and creamed possum and potted possum and possum t-shirts. Well, you got a t-shirt that glows in the dark out on the road, you'll probably get run over because they think you're a possum. Well, I had to put a disclaimer on the back of my shirt to where I couldn't get sued, you know. Oh, but he did get sued for dropping a poor possum at midnight on New Year's Eve. Man, I'm gonna tell you something, it's worth the trip if you had to walk up here. But what about PETA? We don't never bring PETA up. <laughs> we leave them off, you know. The lawsuit and the possum drop in Clay's Corner have attracted nationwide news. Do people say you are a marketing genius? Tuck something and run with it. We'll put it like that, you know. I found the possum in my headlight tonight. Clay's Corner might just be one of a kind. Look at them playing. 
they are playing possum. Go, there were a half a dozen possums in the middle of the road. Got it, Bob? Clay's Corner, possum capital of the world. Bring money and come off. There were a half a dozen possums in the middle of the road. It is a monster hurricane, Sandy, now heading up to the eastern seaboard on a collision course with two other weather systems. Throughout the next hour, we will take you live to the northeast where people boarded up windows and filled sandbags in preparation for this superstorm. And of course, we have crews live along our coast to look at the impact of Sandy on North Carolina. Good evening and thanks for joining us for this special coverage of Hurricane Sandy. I'm David Crabtree. And I'm Deborah Morgan. We have a lot to bring you tonight. Let's get right to Chief Meteorologist Greg Fischel for the latest talk on Hurricane Sandy. And Greg joins us now from the Hurricane Center. Greg, it is still a hurricane, right? It is still a hurricane. Uh, as of the 5 o'clock advisory, and no reason to believe that it'll change intensity a whole lot during the course of the next 12 hours, and then additional intensification from a variety of different sources, perhaps coming tomorrow and tomorrow night prior to landfall. As we take a look at the satellite and the radar mosaic here, you can see that the rain, like yesterday, has stayed down east in North Carolina, not getting back to the triangle. There's the center of circulation, and just look at the tremendous expansion of this cloud shield with this storm. This is a monster storm in size right now and will become a monster storm in terms of intensity as we head toward tomorrow and tomorrow night. Now, as we take a look at the forecast track, this hasn't changed a whole lot. It's moving northeast now, but it'll start to turn toward the north later tonight and then make a dramatic hook toward the north and uh, toward the northwest and west northwest probably coming inland uh, late tomorrow evening somewhere along the Jersey coast with that cone of uncertainty and to the north of there is where the problems are going to be absolutely huge perhaps mind boggling around the New York City area. Now as we take a look at some other information relating to Sandy here these are current wind gusts 49 at Norfolk 49 at Kill Devil Hills the system is offshore and actually moving away from the coast right now so we wouldn't expect these conditions to worsen if anything get a little bit better as we head on through the evening at least in the short term and some of the offshore buoys just off the coast of uh, duck 49 mile per hour wind gusts there and if we take a look at the wave heights you can see that the seas just offshore of the outer banks are running at 23 feet and down near the circulation center about 30 feet now we've been saying for days now that this storm is going to be epic in proportions and as bad as it is along our coast it's it's going to be infinitely worse to the north. We'll be back to tell you why that's going to be the case and how bad it will get coming up in just a few minutes. Back to you. Mm, all right. Thank you, Greg. And we will check back in with you in just a bit. We have live team coverage on the coast. Brian Mims is at Wrightsville Beach. Renee Chu is on the Outer Banks. Gusty winds, rain, hours of punishing waves. Renee joins us now live from Kill Devil Hills, which is seeing a lot of flooding there as well. Renee. David, do I look any taller to you? Because I feel taller, and here's why. As photographer Mark Simpson will zoom out here, I am standing on a sand dune that was not here before. The winds have just pushed up all this sand onto the beach, so we've got this mini sand hill going. We've been dealing with the rain all day, very dreary, and when it's pelting at you from winds, 30 to 50 miles an hour. It is downright miserable. Now, here's the latest from Deer County Emergency Management officials. Road closures throughout the region because of ocean overwash. Highway 12 on Hatteras Island at Oregon Inlet closed because of sand and water covering it. Some areas on Hatteras Island experiencing flooding already. And we've seen some flooding here on the northern part of the Outer Banks. This nonstop rain and wind just making life miserable. All you hear is a constant roar. The outer bands of Sandy hovering over the outer banks provides surround sound. Wind gusts that shred flags, shake shingles, and bend trees like sea oats. You can even hear the sound sound side in Lizzie Constanzer's backyard that backs up to Buzzer Bay. What a view at sunset, quite a threat during a hurricane. What's your state of mind at this point? I'm nervous. I'm, I'm nervous. She fears Sandy could be another Irene. Um, there was about up to here. Last year's hurricane sucked water from the sound and pushed it back with force, flooding Constanzer's home. Blew everything out. It moved walls. 
Um, it blew off my gas tank. I had to get a new roof. It was about $17,000 worth of damage. And then to hear about Sandy's westerly winds, not good for Soundside homes. Might be that way till Tuesday or Wednesday, which indicates a lot of flooding for us. High tide this morning, the house was surrounded by water. Realtor Jeff Scott is checking out an Oceanside property in Kitty Hawk for flooding. We actually put it under contract earlier this week. So far, so good. Water has not creeped inside, but other homes are sitting in water. Beach roads resemble splash rides when cars drive through, all in a vacuum of wind that has yet to let up. The scary thing is at night when you think you're going to lose your roof and it's that the wind is howling and you can't see anything. It is very scary indeed when you have this wind howling and you can see the wind is just still blowing all the sand and it's also causing sporadic power outages here along the outer banks. Now, as bad as this looks now, conditions are expected to worsen tomorrow. Sandy is going to be this prolonged event, so residents are being told to not let their guard down. David, back to you. Wow, that is just amazing. Renee Chu, you don't look like you've grown any, but as light as you are, as heavy as that wind is, I hope that you will tie yourself down. And I mean that in all sincerity. That is Renee Chu live in Kill Devil Hills. We'll be back with Renee in the next half hour with a look at how Sandy is impacting businesses. Yep. Well, right now it's difficult to travel very far on the coast. Many people are sending us pictures so we can help tell the story of Sandy and show the impact of the storm. WRL's Brian Schrader joins us now from the dot com center with some incredible images. Brian? That's right. We're going to head a little farther south on the Outer Banks to the Buxton and Frisco areas. A photographer named Donnie Bowers took these pictures earlier today and sent them into the WRL newsroom. Start you off in Frisco, in that area where you can see the Pamlico Sound has pushed into town. These are pictures near milepost 64. Five, and you're looking there at the High Tides Attic Consignment Shop. And you can see how that water uh, really rose earlier this afternoon. Now, Bowers' pictures of the Frisco Pier are making the rounds on Facebook this afternoon and evening as people around the world watch the storm. And this pier is no stranger to storms. This is the third year in a row that that pier has faced the wrath of a hurricane. Hurricane Earl badly damaged it in 2010, and Hurricane Irene last year. The owners have not been able to afford repairs from those two storms, and they're not sure if Sandy will do further damage. So the damage that you've been seeing perhaps on Facebook this afternoon of the Frisco Pier, that's not necessarily new damage. Some of that damage extends all the way back from Hurricane Earl in 2010. We'll keep an eye on that and let you know how things develop at the Frisco Pier. Let's head a little farther to the north, a little closer to Hatteras, where the driver of this truck had to stop and turn around as water spilled over the highway. The driver of this Jeep decided to proceed on through that standing water there. In Buxton, Bowers captured this picture of rough seas, and nearby people were trying to get sandbags in place. And you can see from the cut of the sand there at the bottom of the picture just how much sand this storm has washed away. Erosion is going to be a big story on the Outer Banks after the storm passes and we get a better look at the kind of damage it left behind. This is the owner of the Lighthouse View Motel in Buxton trying to get the debris out of a storm drain. In addition to the wind and force pushing all that water from the sound onto shore, Outer Banks residents are dealing with a lot of rain from this storm. Latest estimates at least six inches of water on the Outer Banks. And another picture from the Buxton area. This is the parking lot at Canadian Hole, and those are waves breaking from the Pamlico Sound over the pavement. It has been a rough afternoon on the Outer Banks, and you can take a look at more of Bowers' pictures on WRL.com. You'll see a link to the slideshow in our story on the homepage. And if you're watching tonight online from the Outer Banks and you have some pictures that you'd like to share, we'd like to see them. Go to WRL.com and enter Report It in the search box. Back to you. Great pictures. Thank you, Brian. Well, go south of the Cape Hatteras Lighthouse, and that's where you'll find Ocracoke Island. It's part of those fragile Outer Banks. Joining us now by phone is Alton Balance, a longtime resident. Alton, for how many hours now have you been dealing with the rain and these high winds? Well, it seems like uh, at least since uh, very early in the morning, and we had a, a big surge of tide on the incoming tide at this morning was high tide about 7:30, and so we're definitely not letting our guard down because on top of the amount of water that we already have around our homes and businesses we're expecting with the new incoming tide uh, later tonight and certainly in the morning even more so it's not over yet any damage so far that you've seen not that i can see unless some low-lying building got some damage or a vehicle this is kind of a surprise, but if you look at the geography of Pamlico Sound, 
a northeast wind is shoving the expanse mm -hmm. of Pamlico Sound water down on us at our part of the coast. Mm -hmm. And I know you've been through these storms before. How does this one compare to some of the others? All of them are so different. You know, they're a wind event. They're a flood event. They're a combination. This is strange because not much wind. It's such a huge storm. But with a, a lunar tide and mm -hmm. full moon tonight, I believe, mm -hmm. that combined with can make a difference at the old house where I live. Uh, you know, a few extra inches can certainly flood it. So this is this is unusual because of its size, because of the fact that it's on a full moon and it's going to take another day or two to get out of here. Yeah, it sure will. All right, Alton Balance, thank you so much for your insights there. Stay safe. Thank well, you. The southern portions along the North Carolina coastline, a lot calmer this evening. We're going to continue our team coverage now with Brian Mims, who's joining us live from Wrightsville Beach with a little wind. Brian? Just a little wind, David. The rain stopped here early this morning. It's been a windy day here along the state's southern beaches with occasional gusts of 40 miles an hour. And that ocean has been really cranking some impressive waves. So naturally, the surfers have flocked to the surf. I've counted at least 50 surfers between here and the pier. They and they continue uh, to come out. This storm has had a minimal impact on the Wilmington region. No power outages, no structural damage, but just on down the beach a piece, we found some places where Sandy, well, lived up to its name. Here at Carolina Beach, people shovel sand the way people in Buffalo might shovel snow. Marvin Mintz has property on the beach, and in a storm surge, the beach is on the property. He figures a foot of seawater sloshed over his carport. Was this unusual? No, no, actually kind of mild. Years of erosion have shrunk the space between ocean and front. A battery of boulders lines the front to stem the tide, but it's not always a rock solid defense. We had a combination of a full moon coming up, mm -hmm. as well as, you know, the hurricane sitting out there churning. As reliably as the tides, many streets here get waterlogged in a storm. Canal Drive becomes a canal in fact. A chunk of it closed Saturday night at high tide and remained closed Sunday. Standing water and shifting sands weren't the only calling cards of Sandy. It took that out. That was the, you know, that, the steps to going, going down, the, you can see right there. Oh, that, so that, that was taken yesterday. In the next community down, Curie Beach, the angry surf took swipes out of the dunes. Beach erosion, damaging and inevitable as it is, can be an opportunity for men wearing headphones listening to metal. Uh, for me today, it was uh, fishing weights and uh, a few old quarters. John Kelly says Sandy didn't take as much sand as other storms. How much erosion have you seen here on the beach? Well, I, you know, it's hard to gauge, but I, I can tell by the dunes, there's probably been about two or three feet at least taken off at parts of the beach. Other parts, it, does, it looks like the sand sort of building. Here, where life's a beach, life goes on. And these salt sprayed people wait without worrying too much for whatever's next on that wide horizon. And as I look down there on the southern horizon, it's a sky that's beginning to clear, but the remain, the winds will remain fairly gusty here along Riceville Beach as the night goes on, and the surf shall remain up. It's really fun watching these guys, David. Yeah, I understand that, but there's also rip currents out there anytime you have a storm like this. So we know they know what they're doing, but we really hope they pay attention to exactly what they're doing. Brian Mims live at Riceville Beach. Brian, thank you. We have much more ahead tonight on Sandy. In three minutes, we'll take you to Delaware where people in Sandy's path are heeding warnings and taking extra precautions. And the storm is impacting travel up and down the eastern seaboard. We'll take a look at just how just ahead. Greg? All right, Deb, and you can see uh, Sandy here, a big storm in terms of geographical size. It's going to become a huge storm in terms of impact, one that could be the benchmark for the 21st century, and how something that starts as a hurricane can end up bringing a snowstorm to parts of North Carolina. We'll talk about that as well, coming up.
And welcome back to our coverage of Hurricane Sandy. You're looking at the waves there uh, just crashing, continuing to crash at Kill Devil Hills on the Outer Banks. That's the Sea Ranch Resort webcam. And Hurricane Sandy is not expected to make landfall until tomorrow evening, and it could impact 50 million people. So they're now getting ready. We've shown you the conditions up and down the North Carolina coastline. Now Duarte Geraldino is joining us live from Delaware with a look at what's happening from Virginia to the north. And as we mentioned, it, it's just hard to believe, Duarte, this is impacting as many millions of people as it is. That's the difficulty that many people are facing right here. For sure, many are scared and have already evacuated, but you still have another contingent who say, I don't believe it's going to get that bad. But behind me, we can see those waves. Now, what you're looking at is a, part of a doomed area that's fenced off, and then you see the water just kissing that dune area. Well, that ocean, there, there should be at least twice the area of those dunes, some hundred yards, and yet there is not. That water is inching towards the boardwalk, and the big fear is that there's going to be major flooding in at least this area of Delaware. And I know uh, up in New York and New Jersey, a lot of preparations being made up there. Tell us about some of those. Well, one of the biggest things in New York City, uh, they're talking about shutting down the mass transit system, which is really at the heart of the entire city. And once that's shut down, you really have to stay in place. So as a precaution, the mayor is ordering some mandatory evacuations of low-lying areas in New York City. And that's one of the things happening in New York City. And of course, all over the area, similar steps are being taken. Dorte, uh, Deborah and I were talking during the break a moment ago. Those of us who live here in North Carolina, are accustomed to dealing with hurricanes and the threat of storms like this. What about the folks in Delaware? That part of the eastern seaboard doesn't exactly see weather like this every season. No, not at all. I mean, what, what people here are used to is cold, is ice potentially. But the idea of these strong winds and water, that's what has people very nervous. In fact, we spoke with one home builder who said there are about a third, one in three homes in this area are relatively new and they could possibly withstand a strong sturge. But many of the older homes, mm. in his particular view, he says they're not going to make it yeah. if it's that mm. strong. Yeah, we can imagine that. Duarte Geraldino, live in Delaware. Thanks, Duarte. Well, Sandy is the first real test for the new North Carolina Emergency Operations Center. Ken Smith is live there tonight where they are keeping a very close eye on all that is happening. Ken? Yeah, you're absolutely right, David and Deborah. And the first real test actually happened during the Democratic National Convention, but this is the first test when it comes to a storm. And behind me is a state-of-the-art facility. Take a look. DOT, the National Guard, FEMA, all working out of the new Emergency Operations Center. The EOC activated Saturday morning at 8 o'clock, and it's been up and running ever since. National Guard troops are now stationed at an armory in Washington, ready to respond to any emergencies that might come up. Now, a short time ago, I had an opportunity to talk with Doug Corll. He's the emergency management director, and he says being able to monitor all these resources from one central location gets help to people more efficiently. We've got, you know, excellent equipment. We've got enough space to operate. Uh, we've got the Federal Emergency Management Agency here with us, and there's room for them to have space to work. So it's, uh, it's ideal. I mean, this is the kind of place that you really want for an emergency operations center. We've got uh, co-location with the Department of Transportation, so we can see their cameras, and we can see what's happening on the roadways in the eastern part of the state. You I mean, we've got partnership with the Highway Patrol. We've got partnership with the National Guard. National Guard resources are out in the field supporting our operation. So it's just a real, real team effort. It is a team effort. That was Ken Smith reporting live from the Emergency Center. And we're going to go back to Greg Fischel now. And part of the what the state is preparing for is snow in the mountains, too, Greg. Amazingly enough, uh, we've been talking for days now about how the was, system was going to make a transformation from tropical sources of energy to extratropical sources of energy. And once it does that, and once it starts to do that, then it may bring a significant winter storm to the mountains of North Carolina uh, within, uh, oh, say, 36 to 48 hours. But that's down the road a little bit. Let's go on ahead and show you what things look like from a radar perspective. And like yesterday, the rains have stayed down east, but they've been very, very persistent. We really haven't seen much 
much uh, around our area during the course of the day. The latest stats on Sandy, this is the 5 o'clock advisory from the Hurricane Center, 33.4 north, 71.3 west. Max sustained winds at 75. The pressure is at 952 millibars, which is comparable to what Fran was, which was a Category 3 hurricane when it made landfall back in 96. But remember, this system has a much broader wind field. It's not as tightly wound in the middle as a classic hurricane is. And so despite that low pressure, we don't have Category 3 winds at this point. It is moving to the northeast at 15, and if it were to keep doing that, we would be absolutely fine. But it's not going to keep doing that. And we're uh, talking about a storm that is going to move northeast and then make that hook to the north and west. A lot of factors in play here. Of course, we have Sandy sitting here. Big blocking ridge of high pressure up over the Canadian Maritimes. Everything has to go around that. So the next, next upper level low that is out here will be forced underneath that high. And once it gets into this position, then it will begin to hook uh, Sandy back toward the north and west. And we expect a landfall along the Jersey coast again as we head toward tomorrow evening. Again, the wind field is absolutely huge with this thing. So the tropical storm force winds are already affecting a good part of the middle Atlantic coast. And if anything, that wind field will expand even more. And then the hurricane force wind gusts coming inland to well to our north across the middle Atlantic seaboard as we head toward uh, tomorrow, uh, late tomorrow afternoon and tomorrow evening. And again, the thing that makes this storm so scary is the fact that it is such a huge storm in terms of size and will affect so many people. The storm surge is also a very scary thing. As we take a look up here near, near New York and move the clock on ahead, we're looking at potentially a 12 foot storm surge. Look at these colors coming in here as this water is forced westward through the Long Island Sound. This could actually be a devastating event for New York City as we head toward tomorrow night and into Tuesday morning. And coming up, we'll be taking a look at what the storm surges have been like so far along our coast and what they're likely to be over the next 24 hours. Now, there's a lot of local impacts to this, and Amy has more on that coming up now. Amy? Well, as you mentioned, it's a very big storm and we'll likely be feeling the impacts around here in the form of wind and a little bit of rain over the next couple of days. We'll talk about the wind forecast in just a moment. Right now, we want to get you to our local radar. All of the rain today has been to our east, certainly the heaviest rain along our coastline. Cape Hatteras today reporting over three inches of rain, breaking a record. Yesterday reporting over three inches of rain, breaking a wet record then as well. But certainly all of the heavy rain has been to our east today along the coast. It has been dry around here and that will continue over the next couple of hours. But we still have some rain possible in the forecast tonight and possibly into tomorrow and Tuesday as well. Here's a look at this at uh, Sandy as it continues to move to the north and east. As Greg mentioned, expected to make a turn to the north and west in the coming days. But this is a very big circuit and we'll be seeing some wraparound moisture dipping down into our area uh, overnight tonight and possibly into tomorrow and Tuesday as well. So we still have a chance for rain, even though we haven't seen a whole lot around here yet. Here's future cast. It does show a little bit of rain, maybe some light showers this evening, especially along I-95 and points eastward. Tomorrow morning as you're headed out to work, maybe getting the kids off to school, still a chance for a few light rain showers. The heaviest rain will be to our north. And then as we get into tomorrow uh, evening, still a chance for some light rain tomorrow night and some of the Models showing a little bit of snow. We're not completely sold on this, but coming up in just a few minutes, we'll talk about where we could see some snow. We actually have some winter storm warnings in effect for parts of the state. We'll talk about that. Then on Tuesday, we'll start to see some improving conditions as far as the rain, but still very windy. Here's a look at the wind potential, the wind gusts over the next couple of days, over 30 miles per hour, potentially overnight tonight and into tomorrow morning maybe even 40 mile per hour wind gusts in the next couple of days. So while the center of this storm is way up to our north, it's a very broad circulation and it's going to bring us some very strong winds over the next couple of days through probably Tuesday. So it's going to be very blustery around here in the coming days. The wind sticking around it is going to be very breezy through Tuesday, possibly into the early part of Wednesday. 58 degrees right now at the airport overnight tonight. Temperatures dropping down into the 40s tomorrow afternoon highs in the 50s with improving conditions down to the south and especially down to the south and west. Then the big story becomes the cool down Tuesday. Look at the afternoon high only in the 40s. Wednesday Halloween going to be chilly for the trick or treaters. So oh, yeah. definitely a big shock to the system for Tuesday. Definitely mm -hmm. quite a change. Mm -hmm. Amy, thank you. Well, it's a theme becoming all too familiar at UNC mourning the loss of another member of the student body coming up. What happened to this first year student and why police say the rest of the community should not be afraid. And as we continue to track Sandy, this is a live look from Kill Devil Hills. You can see the, churf, the churning of the surf 
wind blowing still in the sand there. We'll continue our coverage for the next half hour of how this storm could not only impact us, but the eastern part of the United States. And now we're back to our Hurricane Sandy coverage. You're looking live now at Wrightsville Beach and look at all of the surfers out there, a paddle border, all taking advantage of the higher than normal waves, but conditions are starting to improve along the southern beaches. We'll continue to follow Sandy, but there is other major news on this Sunday, including this. The Carolina community is coping with the death of a student. The body of 18 year old David Shannon found in the Brewer Lane area of Carborough late last night. Kevin Holmes is live on campus where counselors spent the afternoon. Kevin. David, word continues to spread on campus tonight and across the state. David Shannon is the student. He's from Charlotte. In fact, a lady just told my photographer and I a short while ago that he attended one of the largest high schools in the state and more than 60 students from that high school currently attend UNC Chapel Hill. Shock has filled this campus tonight here in Chapel Hill. David Shannon, a first year student here at UNC. Carborough police detectives tell us his body was found near Brewer Lane. They aren't saying how he died, but tell us this appears to be an isolated incident and the public is not in danger. Here's the deal. Shannon's body was discovered Saturday night. Carborough police detectives are asking anyone who knew about his whereabouts late Friday night to give them a call. Those who knew David say he was a joy to be around, well liked by everyone, and also say they're stunned to learn of his death. I was really shocked because I didn't think this would happen to someone that I knew, especially like Charlotte that I knew. I, it's tough because this is the second death that has happened in Chapel Hill. And the first death she was referring to, of course, the death of UNC student Faith Hedgepeth, who, Hedgepeth, who was murdered in her off-campus apartment in Chapel Hill. No arrest in that case. Police in Carborough continue to work this latest death, the death of David Shannon. They, again, they haven't said exactly how he died. We'll have much more on 11, including reaction from those who knew David Shannon pretty much all of his life. We've caught up with two people who went to middle school, high school, and college here at UNC with them. Hear what they have to say tonight at 11. All right, Kevin Holmes reporting live in Chapel Hill. Kevin, thank you. Sandy is impacting travel up and down the East Coast. RDU International Airport is already warning travelers to expect delays and even some cancellations for the next few days. All flights to New York, New Jersey and Washington, D.C. are already canceled. Your best bet if you're traveling in the next few days is to call the airline ahead of time. Amtrak has canceled service across the Northeast due to the storm. All service north of New York will stop starting tonight at 7. Nearly all Amtrak service across the eastern seaboard will be canceled starting Monday. Still ahead tonight on our special coverage, Sandy taking a toll on coastal businesses. We'll visit a hotel along the Outer Banks. Dealing with dozens of cancellations, plus a lineup of weekend events had to be put on hold. Also, storm preparations are in full gear for the storm. Some fear could be one of the worst in history for the Northeast. You're looking not live now at Wrightsville Beach, where it's, it's gotten a lot darker in the past half hour since our extended coverage of Hurricane Sandy began, but you can see that's not taking the life out of the surfers who are out there enjoying the surf that is up this evening. Now again, we are in extended coverage of Sandy, and if you're looking for the CBS Evening News, you can find that right now on WREL2. Well, we may not be dealing with the worst of Sandy. However, we're certainly feeling the impact of the storm, especially along the Outer Banks. This area is no stranger to storms, the most recent being Irene last summer. We continue our live team coverage now from there tonight with WREL's Renee Chu at Kill Devil Hills. Renee? Deborah, there's rain pelting at me sideways. There's sand blowing all around me. There's even sea foam washing up on the beach. The winds are so punishing. I took the wind gauge here and wanted to see just how fast the wind speeds were. And we've got a reading of 46 miles an hour. At times, the winds will just kind of knock you off balance. It is a little difficult to walk here on the beach with the winds being as brutal as they are. Now, with storm damage, it's not just homes that we're worried about. WRL's Bruce Millworth shows us how Sandy is also taking a toll on local businesses. The force and fury of Mother Nature, tricky to capture for a lasting memory. The rain's coming down hard. The sand is, you know, get covers the camera, so I have my camera in a bag. As a steady rain came down, snowy looking sea froth was flying up. Nasty. 
pretty nasty. Waves pounded the coastline as Sandy slammed some Outer Banks businesses. We've lost a good bit of money. The John Yancey Motel had a bunch of cancellations. 65 rooms were reserved before the storm. Only 16 are now actually occupied. And most of them are all newscasters. This weekend was a big weekend here on the Outer Banks. The chili cook-off, the zombie walk. There was just so many things. Sandy is causing plenty of havoc with down power lines, isolated power outages, and rising water. But we're blessed. I mean, we're, we're, we're blessed how this storm has tracked. While things could have been a whole lot worse, it's still pretty rough. As bad as these conditions are on the Outer Banks, experts predict tomorrow will be even worse. Bruce Mildorf, WRL News, Kill Devil Hills. By the way, Bruce was able to recover his calf. He is going to need it tomorrow. Now, coming up at 10 and 11, you'll hear from locals who say there is no way they're going to leave. They choose to stay and they're going to ride out the storm. Why they choose to stay and why they hate evacuations. David and Deborah, back to you.